Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the virtual home of Princeton Public Library here on Zoom. My name is Janie Herman, and I'm the Adult Programming Manager at the Princeton Public Library. It is my great pleasure to host this afternoon's program featuring Marion Turner's recently released The Wife of Bath, a biography. This virtual talk between two scholars will discuss how Allison is both a literary and feminist icon, and it is being held as part of our Women's History Month programming where we have several programs and events occurring. We also have a resource guide on our website that lists all of our events along with book lists and educator resources. I will put that link in the chat for you. Before we begin, I would like to extend special thanks to Princeton University Press for their assistance in arranging this event and to Labyrinth Books for being our bookseller. If you'd like to purchase a copy of today's book, I will put the link in the chat. Labyrinth can send you the books by mail or you can order online and pick it up at their store in downtown Princeton. Thank you, Labyrinth Books. Please note that this event is being recorded and our events typically go up, typically go up on the library's YouTube channel within a few days. If you have friends or colleagues who could not make it today, let them know it has been recorded and to check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash PrincetonPF. I'll now introduce our guests and ask them to turn on their cameras to join us on screen. During their conversation, please feel free to ask questions using the Q&A function or in the chat for either of our panelists to answer at the end of the conversation. As I said, today we are here for the release of Marion Turner's most recent book. Marion is the J.R.R. Tolkien Professor of English Literature and Language at the University of Oxford. What a great title that is. Uh, she is uh, Chaucer, the author of Chaucer, A European Life, which won the Rose Mary Crochet Prize and was shortlisted for the Wolfson History Prize. Joining Marion in conversation is Emily McLemore, a postdoctoral teaching fellow at the University of Notre Dame who specializes in medieval English literature and gender and sexuality studies. Her research focuses on representations of women and the perpetual entanglement of gender, sex, and violence that extends from the medieval period to the modern one. And I really can't think of a better pairing to have in conversation to start off our Women's History Month programming with this topic. So I'm gonna let Marion and Emily take it away. Thanks very much, Janie. Um, Marion, I wonder if you can first um, sort of set the scene for us, uh, as it were, and um, tell us a little about who Geoffrey Chaucer is, what the Canterbury Tales are, and how the Wife of Bath comes in. Yeah, of course. And um, first of all, thank you so much to everyone for coming, and thank you to Princeton Public Library for hosting us. Um, I was going to say tonight, <laughs> I know it's the afternoon for you, but um, but the evening for me here in in, in Oxford. So. Yeah, just to to remind people, because usually I know there's probably some people in the audience who have recently reread The Wife of Bath in preparation and other and for others, it might be a slightly vague memory from from high school about um, exactly who Chaucer was and who, where the Wife of Bath comes in. So Chaucer was born in the 14th century, so just a few years before a huge pandemic hit in the Black Death, which um, really is quite a different pandemic to, to the one that we've all, all suffered through. Um, he lived then in this really interesting time of, of social change because after the Black Death, there were wages went up because there were so many fewer people to do the work. Um, a lot more women actually got jobs and moved to towns. Um, Chaucer himself lived a fascinating life. He was a, a diplomat, a customs officer, an MP. Um, he did the secret business of the king. He traveled all over Europe. He worked for, for many important women as well as men. Um, he worked for, the, for two different kings. So he had a very interesting life and he wrote a wide variety of texts. And the one that we're focusing on today is the Canterbury Tales, his most famous and um, greatest work, many would say, which he was writing for the last about kind of 13, 14 years of his life. So the very end of the 14th century. And in the Canterbury Tales, a group of people get together in a pub um, in Southwark, just south of London, to go on a pilgrimage to Canterbury. And they decide that they're going to tell stories on this journey 
um, they're all going to, to tell stories and decide who tells the best one. And this group is socially diverse, which is really important because in the kind of models that Chaucer had, the sources, these kinds of stories tended to, to gather together tale tellers who were all socially important or from the same, same social class. But Chaucer makes a really, really important intervention here in saying, well, we should listen to marginal voices as well. We should listen to the voice of a miller and a cook and a sailor and a merchant, as well as the voice of a knight. But although this group is socially diverse, it's not that varied in terms of gender. So there's over 20 men, but only three women. And two of the women are nuns. And then the third woman is the wife of Bath. So you can already tell that she really stands out in this group. Great. Um... And the wife of Bath, of course, is just an interesting character in and of herself. So I wonder if you might talk a little bit about um, about her and who she is um, and really what makes her such a complex and um, actually controversial rendering of medieval womanhood. Yeah, absolutely. So the wife of Bath is described to us in, in great detail, first of all, in the general prologue to the to the Canterbury Tales. And the wife of Bath, one of the things that everyone remembers about her is that she's married five times. So she does everything to excess. She has married five times. She's been to Jerusalem three times. She's traveled all over Europe. So she's done all kinds of interesting things. Um, but one of the things, I mean, one of the key arguments of my book is that she is the first ordinary woman in English literature. So that while there were, of course, lots of women in literature before the wife of Bath, but they tended to be either good women, women, so queens, um, princesses, marriageable maidens, nuns, saints, or bad women, essentially whores or procuresses who procure whores for, for others, um, or witches, old crones, those kinds of, of women. There wasn't any space in literature for a more ordinary woman. So the wife of Bath, when I say she's ordinary, what I mean is she's she's middle-aged. She's what we would think of as middle class. She's She works. She's had a job in the cloth trade. Um, she's sexually active. She has sexual desires. She goes on holiday. She talks about drinking too much with her friends. She she. I mean, she's very you know, sinful and problematic in, in all kinds of ways. She's not perfect. She's, she's not ideal and she's not a monster either. Um, so she really stands out, not only amongst the, the pilgrims in the Canterbury Tales, but also she stands out in the history of women in literature because no one had seen anything like this before in literature. Although Chaucer is drawing on particular sources, he transforms them because the kind of sources that she's, she's based on tended to be figures such as um, Ovid's Dipsas or La Vielle from the Romance of the Rose. And these, these female sources were monstrous figures. They were they were indeed old whores. And Chaucer transforms this figure into someone who is essentially a respectable married woman, although she's very excessive. So when I say she's ordinary, that's that's a kind of a joke because she's also extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Not only extraordinary in the fact that she simply by being ordinary, because that is extraordinary at this at this time in literature, but also she's excessive in every way, you know, with her enormous hat and her many husbands and her frequent journeys. And we hear a great deal about this extraordinariness. So again, in comparison to other characters, Chaucer gives her much more scope to tell us about herself. So we really get a lot of a lot of access to to her to her mind and her thoughts in a way that is is really innovative in in literature at this time. Right, and I she's such an interesting character. Janie had mentioned um, as a literary and feminist icon, and um, I wonder if you might. Uh, in light of in light of all the things that you just said, touch on maybe why that feminist bit can be quite controversial as well, how she's been seen, maybe why she's been seen both as a feminist icon and as an anti-feminist one. Yeah, and I think, I mean, the word feminist is really problematic when we're thinking about the, the 14th century, isn't it? Because it, you know, what the way we think about, about feminism, I think, is, is unimaginable in the 14th century. You know, no one is going around thinking women should have the vote or women should be able to do all the same things that, that men do. I, I don't think people are thinking like that in the 14th century. So it is difficult to, or, or misleading sometimes, I think, to, to, to use the word feminist too much. Though, of course, it's a helpful kind of shorthand for us often. But the wife of Bath, I mean, one of the things that she does is that she, she embodies a lot of anti-feminist stereotypes. So things like, you know, 
being outspoken and speaking back to her husbands and so on. These were the things that misogynists said, well, this is why women are so evil because they do these terrible things. And lots of aspects about the wife of Bath are based in on misogynistic texts. So um, there, were, there were many, many texts which said terrible things about women. And the wife of Bath absolutely parrots lots of those things. So there, for example, there were lots of texts which said, well, women, you know, w widows, are just thinking about sex. And when their husband dies, they're just immediately looking for their next husband all the time. They go to the husband's funeral and all they can think about is who to have sex with next. And when the when the anti-feminists um, wrote those kinds of things, it was a, you know, in a very, you know, bitter and accusatory way. Now the wife of Bath ad admits this. So she says in her prologue, well, you know, I went to my fourth husband's funeral and god help me but I, all i could do was look at the legs of the pallbearer who was carrying his coffin and just think about how lovely they were and how much i liked him and i mean it's obviously a, a terrible way to behave and so you could see that as backing up exactly what the anti-feminists say you know mm. that women are, are monstrous but when the wife of bath says it there are some crucial differences because in in the context of the wife of Bath's prologue, we already know that this fourth husband was adulterous and horrible to her. You know, we're, we're against him already, you know. And, and we know that she, you know, she was not um, unfaithful to him, though he was to her. And the way that she is so kind of self self-deprecatory she sees her own faults she's funny in the way that she's talking about it I think for many readers it kind of flips the anti-feminist um comments and you kind of think well okay that sounds like a terrible way to behave but at the same time you you're encouraged not to not to judge her in the way that you certainly are encouraged to judge the women in when, when St Jerome for example is is saying these things about about women but I think it's yeah I mean this idea of of feminism um or maybe you know if we if we think about it as as showing the woman's point of view because there are certainly many aspects of the prologue in which Chaucer does do that he encourages us to think about what it's like to be to be a woman um, which is something that not many authors had been all that interested in and in her prologue for example I mean maybe most crucially she talks about domestic abuse and then her tale is about rape so she talks about these very serious crimes that are perpetrated on women she talks about them very seriously um and she also kind of makes it clear that the misogynist literature that's written about women is connected to the way that women are treated in real life and i think that's such an important point so in her prologue so she keeps telling us that she's been beaten by her husband you know, she keeps kind of briefly referring to this which in a way that seems to mimic someone who's traumatized, you know, it keeps being briefly referred to, it clearly keeps coming back to her mind. And we're not quite sure what's happened until quite late in her prologue, she tells us that the details of this. And she tells us that I was beaten for a book. And she then details to us that her husband, um, her horrible fifth husband had this book which she calls the Book of Wicked Wives. So it's a collection of all these anti-women tracts that were quite common in the, in the Middle Ages. And we still have manuscripts where you know lots of anti-women tracts were all kind of bound together and people who liked that kind of thing could, could read them over and over again. And she tells us her husband was just reading these things you know, all evening to her every day, kind of saying, look, this is what women are like, this is what you were like. And that leads to an, an altercation in which he ends up... Um, abusing her so dramatically that she is deafened by it and she's she's still deaf that's pretty much the first thing we're, we're told about her in the in the general prologue so his perception of women is filtered through all these awful texts that he's read about women and that's one reason why he he beats her and you know again this idea of the the kind of feminism of her prologue you know with all the caveats that i said about why that work would is somewhat problematic in her prologue she says to us well you know, the problem is that all almost all texts have been written by men. So we haven't had the chance to hear the other side of the story. You know, the literary canon is, is biased against women and we haven't been able to to hear the other point of view. And she says, you know, so everyone thinks these terrible things about women. But if women had written stories as men have in their oratories, they would have said terrible things about men. And so I think that point that we need to listen to women's to women speaking as well as to to men speaking just like we need to listen to people of different social classes is really key um 
because it's it's not that the wife of Bath is right, but that we need to listen to all kinds of voices and then make our own make our own decisions. Of course, that's problematized for us a bit by the fact that the wife of Bath is not in fact a woman. You know, she is Chaucer. So, you know, we can we kind of go down that that route. But in fact, this is another version of, of Chaucer's voice, of course. And it's a very complex voice that is, is filtering a lot of different texts. But I think that that would be the the key aspect of where I see the, a sense of 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 a kind of nascent fledgling idea of feminism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and because you mentioned her tale really briefly, I wonder if you want to go into um, kind of what happens in her tale and why um, that itself is is quite controversial, um, just in the way that she treats a medieval romance, but perhaps even how uh, scholars have read that kind of different ways. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's you just if you imagine it's so interesting, isn't it, to imagine yourself into before you, the first time you read it, you know, if we can if, if we can remember that far back, um, Emily, the first time we read this text. So when you read it, it begins at the court of King Arthur. You know, we've got Arthur and Guinevere and it's it's a kind of time of fairy in ancient Britain and a knight is riding around and medieval readers and modern readers as well, I think. What kind of thing do they expect when they get that opening? They expect mm -hmm. that the knight's going to be the hero. You know, they expect that the knight's going to ride around. Maybe he's going to rescue a damsel. Maybe he's going to go and fight a monster or a dragon. And that's not what happens. As as, as you know, Emily, the, immediately the wife of Bath undercuts that expectation and it and tells us almost immediately that the knight rapes someone. So it's a very serious story about the abuse of, of women. And after that, the the king wants to execute him, and the queen says, "No, give give him to let let me let, let me and my ladies decide on his punishment." And the women decide that they're not going to execute him. Instead, they're going to get him to try to think about what he did. So they try to invent a punishment which will be more um, restorative in a way. They 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 ask him to go away and find out what women want. And this leads into a very complex story. He 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 goes around eventually he finds this monstrous loathly lady who says he can tell him the answer she can tell him the answer but only if he agrees to do something that she will ask ask him and he agrees um she saves his life by by telling him that that women want a kind of sovereignty and then what she asks is that he marries her and there's i think a very powerful moment there where he then says well you know, he's horrified by this and he says take all my goods but let my body go and he realizes to a certain extent what it's like not to have control over your own body when he of course demonstrated he didn't care about his victim having control over her body he didn't care what what she wanted and then the old ugly woman becomes the kind of the ethical center of the story you know she she lectures him at length about not judging people because they are old and poor and ugly but trying to judge people in a more more christian way so again for an audience who would expect the knight to be the ethical heart of the of the story you know the young handsome rich knight it's not him it's the old ugly poor woman mm -hmm. really really interesting after all this he ends up allowing her to have power and then and um, at this point, you know, remembering our, our conversation about feminism, this is where it gets, you know, very disturbing for a lot of readers because the rapist is now rewarded with a young, beautiful, obedient wife. That's what she turns into because this, this local lady is a shapeshifter and she's offered him a, a choice, but he, she ends up saying, you can have it all. And interestingly, that that story of the shapeshifting woman um, is the story that films such as Shrek are, are based on. It's a, it's a long, long lived story and there's lots of other medieval versions as well. Um, but in all the other medieval versions, the crime is not rape. Um, so, so at the end, most readers are quite unsatisfied, I think, in, in lots of ways. And partly, I think what we see in that ending is a sense that this is how romance stories have to end. You know, they always end with the so-called happy marriage and the, the promise of children and so on. And one thing that I think is very interesting about the ending is that we get two endings. So first of all, we get that ending, the, okay, they live in happiness, she obeys him, it's all great. And then without even ending the sentence, the wife bath goes on to say, but I want God to send all of us husbands who will obey us and be subservient to us and if they won't I want them to die of the plague and so it's another kind of monstrous vision but extreme in the in the other way you know so in a sense she kind of models for us two two ways of thinking about the relations between the sexes you know neither of which seems she seems very appealing um and again that's I think part of of 
of the complexity of Chaucer and the way that he keeps challenging readers, that never do we get to a tale really and say, well, that's a satisfying ending. We're always, our, our interpretative um, functions are always challenged. You know, we're always trying to read, read against the text and think about how we might tell it differently, how it's affected by the teller, you know, all those kinds of things. Um, it really, really the question is why would you not want to explore this character after all of that? But uh, yeah. perhaps you can uh, tell us a bit about how um, how this sort of book journey started and why you wanted to uh, look at the wife of Bath and perhaps look at her in this particular way as a kind of biography because um, she's in fact a fictional character and not a real woman. Um, so I wonder if you might talk about that a bit. Yeah, so I think there were a few different reasons. So one key reason for thinking about writing this biography was that I wanted to write a book about medieval women and focusing it on, on this one character allowed me to tell lots of mini biographies of lots of different medieval women. There's often not that much evidence for for lo of lots of detail about one individual woman. But by focusing on this literary character, I then took different aspects of her and looked at both literary sources and historical, you know, real women that lived in the in the medieval era. And I could weave a lot of their stories into this, to this story to try to think about, well, this literary figure, how does she connect to the kinds of women that were around in Chaucer's world? In what ways is she a a figure of the imagination, you know, purely the imagination and literary antecedents. In what ways would she, how would the contemporary audience have thought about her, given the kinds of women that they knew in their worlds? So I thought it was a good way of really being able to give voice to a lot of other, a lot of different women by making this a kind of um kind of composite biography in a way. So in the first half of the book, um, as you know. I have several chapters which deal with different aspects of the wife of Bath. So the much married woman, the working woman, mm -hmm. the um, traveling, wandering woman, um, the storytelling woman. And that allowed me to, you know, to, to, to have access to lots of different women's stories and to tell the stories of, you know, the, the Duchess who's married, gets married four times, um, <laughs> including to a 19 year old when she's 65, for example, about women who traveled all over Europe to the Holy Land, who got interesting jobs, you know, lots of really fascinating women. But then the idea of a, of a biography also allowed me to think about her not only in her own moment, but to think in a quite experimental way about the idea of her right across time and to, and to think about gender across time. And, and again, she was a great lens for this because she has been, I think, more adapted than almost any other literary character by, by anyone. Um, you know, really extraordinary reach across time. Every century, there are so many examples. And, you know, one of the texts I was thinking about was um, Virginia Woolf's Orlando, where she writes a kind of biography of Vita Sackville West, but she fictionalizes it Orlando changes gender at one point and it crosses hundreds and hundreds of years you know and it's this great kind of straddling the centuries biography and that was a book that was in the in the back of my mind in a way as I thought about this woman the this fictional woman right across the centuries and I found that really interesting as a kind of story about gender across time to take this lens and then as I do in the second half of the book and try to trace how how gender in every century is kind of how attitudes to gender are kind of filtered through this character and of course it was it was really interesting then to 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 go right up to the present day and um as you know that the book ends in in 2021 yeah and i before we transition uh into talking about those afterlives which are fascinating um i wonder if you might talk about for a moment did you have any favorite women that you came across in sort of compiling this um biography I had so many, Emily. I mean, really. And I think that was a real joy of the biography was kind of excavating these women who were often really kind of brave and striking and risk taking and interesting, but who haven't really had a voice in in history before, you know, but going back to the records. So, I mean, I yeah, I. I hope I can mention a few that you're not going to make me just just pick one. Um, but, you know, so, so I, but I think so women like, you know, the silk women in the 1360s, a whole group who form a kind of union together in the 1360s, you know, and kind of protect, you know, write documents together and protest sure. against a man who's price fixing in, in London at the time. Um, I. I mean, I found Marjorie Kemp's maid a really interesting character. I mean, she's not my favorite in that 
I don't want to be her friend and I don't want her to work for me. But I thought <laughs> she was so interesting. So this is a woman, um, for those who haven't yet, yet read the book, who um, so she sets off on a journey with Marjorie Kemp. So Marjorie Kemp was, you know, a real woman, one of our earliest named writers in English, who was married, had more than a dozen children, and then tried to turn to a life of God, um, persuaded her husband to a vow of chastity traveled around Europe so this is so she lived in the late 14th and early 15th century and then she dictated her book in the 1430s which is the first kind of autobiography in in English and she tells us about her travels around Europe and that when she was traveling around Europe her maid abandoned her and I mean it's such an interesting story because and remember she is on pilgrimage and, she, and if you were going on pilgrimage you had to travel with a group in order to be to be safe so she traveled with the group and the group all got sick of her and they were sick of her for two reasons mainly. And one was that she talked about God too much, you know, on pilgrimage. And the other was that she was a vegetarian and people just couldn't handle this. And so they all abandoned her and her maid abandoned her as well. And then the next time we meet her maid, Marjorie has managed to get to Rome by finding other companions. And her maid is there. And after trading in Marjorie for other employers, she's now traded them in. She's no longer a maid. She's now the cellarer at the English hospice in Rome, which means she's in charge of the wine um, for this major English hotel in Rome that, that takes in English travellers and, and pilgrims. She's earning a really good salary. She dispenses charity to Marjorie. You know, she gives her money. And she's a really interesting example Example, as I say, quite a ruthless girl, I think, but um, a really interesting example of someone who seizes opportunities, you know, who takes risks, gets better jobs, you know, travels widely and, and betters herself. Um, and I think that one of the reasons I find her interesting is that many people think that most medieval women lived very domestic um, lives. And in mm -hmm. fact, you know, many medieval women worked had jobs uh, of course they suffered hardships but they also had opportunities and they and they seized those those opportunities often um but maybe i should ask you a quick question back did you have a favorite woman in the book emily um I, i'm i'm going to be honest and i quite was in, i was really fascinated by the duchess and the the much right. older duchess and and the marriage between the uh with the 19 year old uh, young man, which my students were asking me about this week when I taught the wife of Bath, we had some conversations about that. Um, because as usual, they're, they're horrified that a 20 year old Jenkin is marrying the 40 year old wife of Bath. And so we had to talk about how um, that uh, was not that was not entirely uncommon. Uh, in the medieval period so yeah. it was an interesting it was an interesting conversation well that's um, great I'm glad you did that because yeah I mean it's, it's really interesting isn't it when you've got a historical example it's so much more extreme you know that this is yeah. because the wife of Bath of course is yeah she's she's only you know something over 40 whereas yeah this woman the the, the 65 year old and the teenager is um as a real life example but even yeah. more extreme is is great I think really interesting um yeah, and I, I this is this is a conversation for another day, but the the number of parallels that continue to come up between Marjorie and Kemp and the wife of Bath is also fascinating, and a lot of those came through um, for me with your book. Um, so that's that's been something I've been thinking more about. But uh, putting a pin in that for uh, again another day, um, because I want to talk with you about these um, afterlives as well, and there's so many, and uh, that was one of the really exciting things for me reading this book because I knew there were a lot, but I didn't know that there were. Uh, I did not know that there were this many. So um, I wonder if you might talk about, did you have any surprises in in doing that kind of research and what what was shocking or surprising for you? I really did. I mean, I think, and I mean, similarly to exactly what you just said, that when I, when I started, you know, when I'd read, written the book proposal and was starting to work on it, I knew there were lots of great examples, but I found so many more just in the course of of doing my my research and so you know I started to get to a point where I kind of thought can I find an author who hasn't done a version of the wife of Bath you know there's just just so many you know from the from the anonymous um ballads through you know Shakespeare Voltaire James Joyce Pope Gay Dryden Pasolini in film and up to up to Zadie Smith so really an, an enormous number um and yeah where to start well I think that, I mean, just to, think, to talk maybe first of all about the kind of, um, I think some of the big trends that we see in adaptation, mm -hmm. because on the one hand, of course, 
what interest one of the things that really interested me was was simply the fascination that right across time there is this fascination with the wife of birth and people keep going back to her obsessively you know I, I found lots of examples of people who would write versions of her and would then rewrite them you know there's this kind of obsession where they they just mm -hmm. can't leave her alone but at the same time she clearly provokes anxiety in a lot of a lot of writers um mainly male writers that a lot of anxiety so you keep seeing people trying to to kind of put her in her place you know to to tame her to make her fit into into the kinds of models that we were talking about at the beginning about the way that Chaucer breaks away from those those stereotypical models and does something different. But a lot of authors try to put her back in particular boxes. They punish her. You know, they write sequels in which she ends up, you know, being humiliated, um, where she's not allowed to get married again, but everyone else does at the end of the play, for example, in Gay's mm -hmm. play or in um, Percy Mackay's play in the, an American author in the early 20th century where um, <clears throat> she wants to marry Chaucer, but she's forced to marry the Miller out, out, because there's a kind of conspiracy between all the important men, including the king and the law, to make her marry someone um, low class and, and vulgar that she doesn't want to marry. So we keep seeing those kinds of, of patterns. Um, and I suppose, you know, one of the, yeah, if I just go back in time a bit and talk about maybe the, the ballads, um, mm -hmm. So because, if, yeah, if we think about the kind of some of the early reception. So in the 16th and 17th century, there was this really popular ballad called The, the Wanton Wife of Bath. Um, and it is a really I mean, it's a really kind of fun idea where the idea is that the wife of Bath has has died and she gets to Heaven's Gate. And at Heaven's Gate, no one wants to let her in. So all of these different important men from the Bible come and say, you can't come in. And she says, but hang on. And then reminds them about their own sins. And they kind of eventually, you know, kind of retreat. And then another one comes and the same thing happens. So she argues with all of them. And eventually Christ comes and eventually she she does get into heaven. And this was a wildly popular ballad in the in the late 16th and through the 17th century. And it was rewritten. There's a later Scottish version. There's, you know, loads and loads of, of printings of it. But it also provoked extreme anxiety. So in both 1600 and 1632, we see printers being, first of all, threatened with prison and then actually imprisoned for printing this ballad. And we also see the ballad itself being burnt. And that's a really, I think, um, neat and interesting example of the way that, you know, her voice keeps coming forward, but then people keep trying to suppress it. But even when they try and suppress it, you know, they didn't burn all the copies, the ballad, you know, resurfaced again. You know, one of the one of the epigraphs I use in the book is, um, you know, nevertheless, she persisted. You know, whatever happens, people keep trying to silence her. But her voice keeps coming back and kind of surging through, even though she does have to take an awful lot of knocks. Yeah, the um, I wonder if you might talk about the the sort of waves of misogyny um, that uh, parallel to parallel to her narrative or her kind of adaptations, because it's interesting uh, that perhaps that misogyny doesn't resonate quite as powerfully when we might expect it would in the Middle Ages, and uh, it comes it comes later and it comes in kind of different different settings in different decades. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think that it's um. It's really striking that that the most extreme responses to the wife of Bath come in more recent decades. So, you know, although we see so we see attempts to kind of silence her, we see kind of um, so say, OK, so, so to give one example of kind of censorship. So in the 15th century, people scribes did not try to censor the wife of Bath. They left her voice but they tried to argue with her, you know, so in the, in the 15th century manuscripts, you see real anxiety from scribes. So scribes tend to, um, so they often will write glosses or notes at the side of a manuscript page. And in many manuscripts, they write a lot more next to the wife of Bath's prologue than they do on any other bits of the Canterbury Tales. You know, they're trying to kind of make sure that readers don't believe the wife of Bath or, you know, take her seriously or act like her. They'll write great detail, you know, trying to counter her voice. But they don't, you know, cross her voice out. They try to, they try to, to debate with her. In the 18th century, in contrast, it just wasn't as acceptable for, for a woman to talk about sex. Um, and although it was, it was novel 
for, in Chaucer's time to have um, to have this kind of middle aged woman ex- talking freely about her sexual desires. But people were quite comfortable with, you know, extremely explicit discussion of sex. In the 18th century, Pope does a translation of the Wife of Bath's prologue, and he removes from it all the references to her genitals and having sex in the morning and her body. And, you know, there's not that much left after you take all that all that mm-hmm. stuff out. And at the same time, Dryden had said that he he wanted to to translate the Wife of Bath's prologue, but he didn't dare because it's too licentious. And in his prologue to his fables, he keeps coming back to the Wife of Bath's prologue, and I think that's the one that got away. That's the one I don't dare to translate, but I really want to. Um, so you see a kind of censorship happening then of her, particularly if her talking about her body, which you know, wasn't so much of a concern early on. There's also, I think. I mean, two really, I think, disturbing and interesting examples of misogyny. So in the in the 18th century, that was when the wife of Bath first goes abroad. Um, and again, I was I was I was really interested in, in kind of imagining her almost, you know, as this little character who's got out of her text and you know marches across the world. So she gets she goes over to France in the 18th century and then goes all over Europe, and then later she goes to America and then she goes to, to other parts of, of, of the world as well. But so her first kind of foray abroad is to France in the 17th. 60s and two different people translate um Dryden's version of her tale not not her prologue because Dryden did dare to translate her tale but but not her prologue um and Voltaire's version is I mean really disturbing because he he essentially although he he talks about the rape he makes it clear that he doesn't really think that it is rape or that rape is is important so you know he he depicts it in a way that see, that seems to be rape but then he depicts the girl kind of calmly asking for money afterwards and says that you know what she's annoyed mm-hmm. about is not getting money and then he um when the when the knight has to have sex with the old ugly woman he portrays that as really the rape you know as, as the poor mm-hmm. victim knight who's having to have sex against his will and then he he turns this scene into you know what into what he clearly thinks is high comedy and there's a there's a long focus on this man's erection and on his extraordinary bravery and valor in managing to have sex with an ugly older woman. And he talks a lot about how glorious this is and what an amazing deed of chivalry it is, and so on. And so it's this kind of mock epic, you know, comedy. Um, but it's also when you look at the wife of Bath's tale, Volta has transferred has translated this tale, a, a story about kind of rape and female ethics and um teaching a rapist what really matters he's trans he's transformed that into a story about how amazing it is for a young man to be able to get an erection when he's having sex with an older woman um really very disturbing and you know voltaire of course you know famous liberal but not so much when it came to women and that's true in later decades as well. So later centuries as well, because what I found you know, really shocking was that the most misogynist depictions of the wife of Bath came in the 1970s, you know, that was the, the decade when, when I was born. Um, so it had good things, the 70s, but also bad things. Um, and, you know, in, so, so a few examples, but the main one is Pasolini's film of the Canterbury Tales, which, you know, some of the audience here, you, some of you may well have, have seen this film. Um, I don't know, have you ever watched it, Emily, that Pasolini film? I have not. Um... I've I've not I've been aware of it for a long time and yeah, when I, yeah. when I get around to trying to watch it I have a lot of trouble finding a location to actually watch it so um yeah and it, it is, and it is yeah. it's very disturbing I mean I don't exactly recommend yeah. it you could tell from reading my book um, yeah. <laughs> because I think one of the one of the really striking things in general about that film is it's an absolute travesty of Chaucer's aesthetic principle of variety. You know, as I was saying earlier, what, what's key to Chaucer's Canterbury Tales is, is not only this idea of lots of different people telling stories, but that they will tell different kinds of stories. You know, as, as you know, that within the Canterbury Tales, you've got romance, you've got bawdy stories about sex, you've got saints' lives, you've got prose moral tracts, you've got beast fable, you know, all these different mm-hmm. kinds of stories. But all that Pasolini is interested in is sex. So he tells eight stories, they're all about sex. Some of them are about sex in the original, some of them aren't at all, but he just puts in extra scenes such as, you know, gratuitous brothel scenes with very disturbing sexual practices in order to make them all about sex. And the segment about the wife of Bath is the one that's, that I find particularly disturbing and, and misogynist because he he depicts 
the wife of Bath as absolute monster figure, the, the kind of monster figure that um that was in some of Chaucer's sources and that he, you know, to a certain extent humanized. Um and he and, and he takes away all Pasolini takes away all the kind of vitality and humor and the ethical sense, the sense of hope and life that's in the wife of Bath. And he depicts having sex with the wife of Bath as actually literally killing her fourth husband, like he dies. Um, and then she's immediately, you know, while he's dying, she's off trying to pleasure this man who'll become her fifth husband, but he can't get aroused by her. He's not sexually interested in her. In the end, she, the very end of the segment, she bites off his nose, bites at his nose in a kind of symbol of, of castration. So <laughs> you know, she's she's depicted as, as an absolute, you know, monster. She's voyeuristic, she's sexually, you know, voracious, but 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 people are not interested in in her sexually. So mm -hmm. again, it's this case of a, a famous liberal having an absolute blind spot when when it comes to women and particularly older women. Yeah, I mean the and the seventies is interesting too. I I mean, and I I'm not sure if if you want to comment on how that might be, you know, responding to the feminist movement at the time, I, I mentioned when we chatted the other day about um, an, an adult coloring book that I had found um, of the wife of Bath that's um, where she's portrayed as particularly grotesque and, and the book itself is pretty pornographic. Um, and so I wonder if this is, if you had any thoughts on, you know, why, why that particular moment and why that particular decade where people might be treating the wife of Bath in these, in these ways. Yeah. I mean, I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think, I think more First of all, more broadly, when we look across time, it is, I think, very sobering and important for us all to remember that history does not progress in some kind of, you know, constantly incremental way that actually things go backwards as well as forwards that, you know, there were in the Middle Ages. So one of the things I talk about in the first half of the book is the, the so-called golden age for women in medieval London, where, you know, some some historians have written about the fact that there were, you know, relatively good conditions for many women in medieval London compared with other parts of the world, but also compared with what came came later, that in the in the 16th century, there was a, a downturn in, in economic conditions for women in, in many ways. Um, and there are particular reasons for that that I know we don't have time for now, but the but the idea that history goes goes backwards and forwards, I think is just something that we all need to, to remember because it's not necessarily intuitive. I think, yeah, I think it's possible that we do get that one, one reason at times that we get backlashes of extreme misogyny is in is in a kind of tension with with progress so when there is progress that that can prompt kind of extreme responses and also of course to a certain extent the you know the the sexual liberation movement then then you know license certain kinds of kind of explicit sexual explicit depiction of sex for example mm -hmm. which is then open to misogynistic ways of of depicting sex so I think that 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 in some ways, yeah, some of the really extreme responses of the of the seventies might be located in that specific kind of post sexual liberation, or, or at the beginning of of the of new sexual, shortly after new sexual liberation laws and so on. But I find, I mean, those responses are are really disturbing. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, interesting as well what's happening in the seventies because another thing that happens in the seventies is that for the first time we really get um, more detailed female responses to the wife of Bath. I mean, there are some earlier responses. Um, you know, I found a really interesting um, 18th century um, woman who illustrated the Dryden's version of the wife of Bath. And I thought that was very interesting. But in the 1970s, mm -hmm. we get a woman actually writing a, a novel based on the wife of Bath. And what I found so interesting there was that in that novel by Vera Chapman, who was one of the founder members of the Tolkien Society, where she was known as Belladonna Took, um, and she was one of the first women to um, to study at Oxford University. Fascinating woman. So she writes this novel about the wife of Bath, and she clearly, you know, unlike Pasolini, Vera Chapman is on the wife of Bath's side. You know, she's trying to defend her. She wants us to like her. But the way that she goes about that is, unfortunately, I, from my perspective, is that she decides she has to make the wife of Bath more typical, you know, more tra more more traditional to fit her into um, the kind of boxes that people are more familiar with so she makes her a loving mother for example lots of children who she's devoted to she twice puts her in a position where she's a damsel in distress where she's at risk of rape and she gets rescued by men so she puts her into these more familiar boxes in, in her attempt to to make people like her I think so I thought that was also a really interesting kind of flip side of what's going on in the 70s. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and what about right now? Um, how is the wife of Bath being uh, being adapted and being treated? Um, I believe Zadie Smith's play is uh, just relatively new as of 2021, correct? And it's yeah. on its way to the States? It's on the um, States. So I wonder exactly. if you might talk about some of those. Right now, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So the last chapter of my book um, talks about 21st century adaptations of The Wife of Bath, particularly by um, Black British women. And so there are three different adaptations by different women that that I focus on there. And it's, I mean, it's quite pleasing for me in a way that I was able to to end the book on a more hopeful note rather mm-hmm. than on uh, on some of the earlier, more more negative um, versions. So the, though there were also earlier really interesting ones, and I think what Shakespeare does with the wife bath is really fascinating, and we haven't had time to talk about that, but everyone can read the Shakespeare chapter. But the um, but the so, so Zadie Smith's Wife of Wilsdon, which premiered here in, in London in um, November 2021, and that's had another run recently, and then it's currently on in um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the American Repertory Theatre, and then after that it's going to, I think, the BAM in, in New York. Um, so Zadie Smith has made Alison and to, into Alvita, who is a 21st century woman of Caribbean background living in Northwest London in the area that Zadie Smith herself came from. Um, And she tells both the prologue and the tale in the play. And it's in some ways quite closely, you know, it it adapts Chaucer quite closely. There is an author figure. There's, um, she she writes in the iambic pentameter, which is the poetic form that Chaucer wrote in and indeed that he he invented and, and pioneered. Um, it draws on the text very closely, but she also brings it kind of up to the present day. So as they said, Alvita is a contemporary woman. Um, the authority figures are no longer people um, such as St. Jerome, their um, they're contemporary pastors. She also has people like Nelson Mandela is, is in there at one point. Um, and the tale is no longer set in Arthurian Britain. It's now set in 18th century Jamaica amongst a community of, of freed slaves. And things like the, the Book of Wicked Wives that I mentioned before, it has become a collection of books by men such as Jordan Peterson. And Zadie Smith references thick movements such as, as Time's Up, for, for example. There's a great line where she says, you know, the shock never ends, where women say things usually said by men. And that line really resonates when you know that she's drawing on a 14th century text and saying, look, these things, these discussions about misogyny, about women being interrupted all the time, which happens in the play, which happens over and over again in the Wife of Bath's prologue, about mansplaining, domestic abuse, rape. These are issues that are still very, very live today, of course. And so and I think Zadie Smith is is using the Wife of Bath partly to to get across that sense that these are long term issues that we still have to deal with and talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I see we're coming close to the end of our time. So I wonder okay. if you might talk about before we before we have to uh, conclude and go to questions. Um, what do you see as maybe the future of the wife of Bath? Um, and perhaps touching on what I, I mean, I think you've already touched on this. What what kind of maintains our fascination with the medieval period and there's so much resonance still, but uh, in particular, the, the future of the wife of Bath might yeah, be a great Yeah, concern. I know you want to go to questions, so I'll just answer those as, uh, <laughs> you know, very quickly. So I think the wife of Bath, she's being adapted more today than ever before, so we're going to see a lot more of her. She's We're going to see um, virtual wife of, wives of Bath. I think she's going to be in computer games and artificial intelligence, you know, all over the place, because the wife of Bath is always kind of new and being and being reinvented. And I think we're fascinated by the wife of Bath, like we're fascinated with the medieval in general, because she's both um, familiar and different. You know, on the one hand, we can relate, as I was just saying, to so many things that she's talking about. On the other hand, we have to make imaginative leaps to try to think about what was it like in to live in the 14th century as a woman or as, or as anyone. And also, in what ways is she not like us? Is she a literary figure? Is she something different? So it's that tension, I think, between the familiar and the different that keeps challenging us to to think mm-hmm. anew about her. Wow, this has been fascinating. And I've been putting some things in the chat as we have gone along. Um, uh, links for learning about um, Vera Chapman and looking at the Wanton Wife of Bath lyrics. So, um, as always, I, I love hosting these conversations because I get to learn a lot along with the participants. Um, so we're waiting for some questions, but I did have one question and I know Emily, um, this is something that 
um, I know you wrote about, but I, th I think the idea of um, teaching consent from the wife of Bath as a, as a way to kind of, I mean, particularly even with high school students and university students using the wife of Bath as it has to be studied anyhow often in these concepts. Um, so how can you phrase the wife of Bath as a way to teach students now about consent? And I know, Emily, I think that's something that you're probably also poised to talk about. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Marian answer answer first, and I can I can add in. So your question is, how do we teach? How do we talk about consent with with students? Um, I mean, I think that when we're thinking about the wife of birth, the wife of birth's tale is profoundly about about consent, which I think is really important. That you know, the wife of birth is 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 the tale shows us how a rapist hasn't thought about consent and the importance of putting of his being put into that position of someone who feels that they are losing control over themselves over their own their own body but i think there's also there's often very difficult things i think when you're teaching medieval literature about in thinking about consent because there's another important female character crusade for example who seems to consent to to her lover troilus but it's clear from the text that she's been put, put in a position where her consent is meaningless because this is going to happen whether or not she she officially consents. So I think sometimes you have to talk about what it means to live in a patriarchy whereby your your free will is so so severely constrained, which of course many women today live in those kinds of, of societies as well. So I think sometimes you know you, you're trying to to get across the idea that that this woman has been put into into a position where she is not able to give any kind of of consent. What what do you think, Emily? Um, I mean, I think that the the wife of Bath teaching the wife of Bath's prologue and tale even independently is really powerful. Um, simply for the sake of showing that women have sexual desires. Um, and that they're, I mean, it it can be a tricky it can be a tricky prologue to teach. Um, as I have, as I have found out over and over again, um, but I think I think combining those things is a is a really powerful opportunity to talk about uh, the fact that women do desire, um, and uh, that there's this instructional kind of tale um, in in showing how women's desires should be represented. I also find it really really powerful to teach alongside the um, first fragment of the Canterbury Tales, um, which include in particular to Fablio um, a kind of really body sexual um French genre um where there uh where there is rape as the butt of a joke um and uh so having the wife sort of speak back to those narrators and those particular tales has proven really powerful in my in my classrooms and especially teaching in a Catholic university when those conversations are not happening um as often um and openly in the institution yeah, I think that's such a good point about the importance of of trying to get students to see the wife of Bath in conversation with other pilgrims' tales as well, because that's so fundamental with Chaucer that that idea that you you're listening to different stories and different voices. And one of the fascinating things about the wife of Bath is that right from the moment of her of her kind of conception, she gets out of her text, and she's also referred to in other Canterbury tales. In, in both the Clarks and in the Merchant's Tale. And she's referred to by characters within those tales who really shouldn't know about her. And she also talks about her in one of his short poems, which she doesn't do with any of the other Canterbury Tales pilgrims. So we also see her herself kind of having this power right from the start that, you know, she seems to be too big for her, her, for her text, and, which is the same as Falstaff later with, with Shakespeare, that these authors seem to have their own favorite character who expands beyond their text. Awesome. Um, we have one question here, and Faye, if you can clarify in the chat, um, you're asking, what is the best modern English translation? Is this for all of the uh, the Canterbury Tales? Um, so she's asking about yeah. the best modern English translation to read. Let's see if Faye can yeah. do that. And so we have a second. One, oh, sorry, go on. So there's one by someone called David Wright, which is good. That's a more recent one. There's also an older one by Neville Coghill, um, which is older, but it's, you know, it, it's, and, and it, it's still it's still um you know very widely published. And one of the good things about that is that they I see that they've now you can get just a translation of just the wife of Bard's prologue and tale. And here in some bookshops here in the UK, they've been selling just that like alongside my book. So you can just buy the kind of the Coghill 
prologue and tail for kind of two pounds so I guess you know three dollars um a lot which is quite good if you just want to kind of just read the wife of Bath. but you can also get the whole Canterbury Tales and if you just want to look online another thing you can do is if you go on the Harvard site you can get both the Middle English and the Modern English like interleave together which some people like to do to, to be able to kind of move backwards and forwards and see some of the the Middle English and some of the Modern. Excellent. Thank you. And then we had another question um, asking um, about if you have watched or know of the early 1970s film, Harold and Maude. I don't know Harold and Maude, no. Do you, okay. Emily? Or do you, Janie? <laughs> um, I've heard of it. I know it. I'm not sure if I've ever seen it. Yeah, because they were wondering about, I guess, because it port it's a portrait of a sexy older woman in this film and um, how it may relate to the wife of Bath in this context. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I mean, it is interesting because I think what we, what we see in depictions of the wife of Bath is very much the idea of, um, it's not a kind of Mrs. Robinson older woman. You know, the, the adaptations are in, in the seventies are tend to be this kind of, um, this monster older woman, you know, this kind of horror of female sexuality that we see in the Pasolini that I was talking about. and. Um, and another example I talk about in the book is, I mean, because Wife Bath got everywhere. There's an amazing Polish communist adaptation in the 70s where there's this kind of extraordinary um, poster of the Wife of Bath. I don't know if anyone will be able to see this. No, I don't think they will really. No, it's not going to work. But it's um, <laughs> it's this amazing picture of kind of the Wife of Bath kind of tied down to the earth and kind of her body is... Um, is, is focused on is is extreme is, is caricatured she's in a kind of grotesque underwear she's entirely passive and recumbent and there are men eating their dinner off her belly um and off her body so they're monstrous as well but there is this sense that um that her her voice has gone completely she's got no brain or mind or voice is all about her her body as something which is um is kind of to be a, a pure fleshly thing to be um a, a, to be focused on as someone else's appetite so i think that you know we don't the wife of bath is taken on not as the sexy older woman in in most of those adaptations but in in, in that kind of 70s era but as a kind of the horror of female sexuality okay oh uh, the person who asked the question about harold and maude chimed in and to say that in harold and maude um she is depicted as heroic, beautiful, and lovable. And a younger man discovers a deep love for her as well as sexual attraction for her. It's an extraordinary cult classic movie. So maybe that'll be- I'll have to see it. Yeah, I'll have yeah, to Maybe that'll be something you. for you to, to do some viewing. And we had somebody yeah, here, like I'm just wanting you to revisit, uh, which was the Pope? I know you mentioned it, um, went by pretty quickly. Which Pope rewrote the tale prologue without any sexual references? Alexander Pope. So early 18th century, right? Oh, so it wasn't a pope, it was Alexander Pope. Yeah. So I think yeah. the person was... Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, right. yes. Yeah. So, so, um, so he was a British writer of the of the early 18th century. He, he wrote a lot of different things. Um, yeah, not not a Catholic pope. I mean, that really would be interesting if one of the Catholic yeah. popes had... Yeah. Like, I wish that were true. <laughs> I wish true. it were. Um, but no, for Alexander Pope. So he... um. And he wrote, he rewrote some other Chaucer texts as well. He wrote a version of the House of Fame, um, but the, the Wife of Bath is the one I was talking about. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, it wasn't a real Pope. Sorry, I can't tell you it was, you know, it was John Paul II or something. Okay, well, I think that uh, sums up our audience questions and we're coming at the top of the hour. So we've had a nice full hour long discussion of the Wife of Bath, which has just been so fascinating. And Emily, you've got the book there in the back. Can you hold up the cover? I love the cover of this book. It's, it's, um, it's lovely. Yes. Yeah. It, it, it just stands out and it, it draws you in to read it. Um, and as I said, you've done remarkable research to do this. And I think it's a, a great, um, a great reference for going forward for many academic reasons. And, and um, I'm so glad that um, to have met both of you um, in this process. And I want to thank you for being here today. And again, um, Labyrinth Books has the copies of the books on sale and you can go to princetonlibrary.org to find out about our other upcoming Women in History Month event, um, including we have Diane Wilson coming to the library this Wednesday to talk about her book, The Seed Keeper, which follows generations of women, um, uh, Native American women and their role with being the keepers of the seeds for their tribes. And it's a novel, it's beautifully written. And we have um, some film screenings, including the one um, about the Me Too movement. Why is the name of that one escaping me? 
the reporters that uncovered it. Anyhow, uh, so check out our, our resource guide. It's been a long Sunday afternoon already. <laughs> and anyways, thank you, Emily. Thank you, Marion, for joining us and for this fascinating conversation. And we've got lots of people in the chat saying wonderful. Thank you. Um, they want to go out and buy the book and um, that they learned a lot. So, um, and for those of us here in central New Jersey, go out and enjoy the rest of this beautiful sunny afternoon. And uh, we'll see everybody later. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Janie. Thank you.